Hi, I'm Meredith Hutchison Hartley. And I'm Emily Geddes. And I'm Frank Hutchison. And welcome back to the Hidden History of Business podcast. Today, we're going to be continuing our discussions of food by talking about butter. The history of butter is really the history of survival and adaptation and everything that makes business business, supply, demand, and value. Innovation, evolution. Exactly. Now, Emily, before we get started, you were going to explain how butter is actually made and why we want to bother turning milk into butter. Yes. In its simplest form, butter is simply heavy cream that is shaken. And then it separates into the solids and the buttermilk, and you have your butter. But that is kind of a deceptively simple description of the process. If you go back to the beginning, you have to have cows, and you Mm. have to take care of these cows. You have to feed them properly. You have to make sure that their stalls are cleaned out so that you have a, a clean area to work in. You have to milk them regularly. Then you have to let the milk sit so that the cream rises to the top. You can make butter out of whole milk, but it works better if you skim the cream off the top and just (sighs) use the cream. How do you do that? You can just simply use a spoon. Okay. You can just use a spoon to scoop the... Once the cream has separated from the rest of the milk, that's why you let it sit, um, it rises to the top and you can just scoop the cream off the top. And and once you (coughs) see that there's some more watery liquid, you can stop the skimming Mm. process. In fact, your mother tells a story about when she was a, a kid that they'd get milk from uh, Hanson's Cow Palace. The milk, which would be like 2%, it would come, and they would actually have about two inches of cream on the top of these gallon bottles. Wow, that's a lot of cream. Yeah. It was. Wow. So you gather that cream, you skim that off the top, and then you just drink the milk like normal, but you collect this cream, and you let it sit, first of all, to make sure it's at room temperature, because that makes butter better, but also so it can culture a little bit, kind of like, with our yogurt, and then you have to churn it. You can do this by hand. You can do small batches in a mason jar today, but everyone has seen those butter churners, those round wood barrels, skinny barrels with a stick in the top Mm -hmm. that you move up and down, butter churners. Some way to move the milk around, and it will take a while, but it will eventually thicken and then kind of become the consistency of whipping cream, and then you keep going because it will eventually break into the solids and the buttermilk. At that point, you separate out the buttermilk. You just strain it through a colander or something like that so that you have your solids and you have your buttermilk, and then you save your buttermilk to make yummy pancakes or something like (laughs) that. And with the solids... You rinse them, again, to make sure you've gotten as much of the buttermilk off as you can, and then you start patting it, kneading it, pushing it together until you have all of the solids together. And in the process, you're still getting rid of the last vestiges of the buttermilk from the butter solids. Now, we have the traditional image of the butter churner. That's that big, tall, round thing with the handle on top, except... When I was growing up, my mother had, from her ancestors, I don't know how far back, this little squat thing that was round and had legs on it, and it had a hand crank in the center, and it had the chute at the top, and that was a butter churner as well. Yeah, that's, kind of, that's a paddle turner, actually. Yes. We're going to talk about that a little bit later in the podcast. But also kind of like an ice cream maker. Yes. Yeah. Only a sideways, not right. vertical. Interesting. So anyways, once you have the butter solid separated out from the buttermilk and you've washed it and you've pressed it and kneaded it together so you have this solid chunk of butter, you can at that point add herbs, spices, salt, whatever you want to the butter itself. Now butter, being a product from an animal, will change depending on what the animal has eaten, depending on the animal's diet. And depending on the time of year, kind of the same with eggs, we have chickens in our backyard. And there are times in the year when they're able to free range a little bit more, where the yolk is a deeper, richer orange than it is in, say, the winter, when they're eating more of the feed that we buy from the store. Same thing with the dairy cows. If they're able to get out and eat more of the fresh grass, their milk is going to be a slightly different flavor, different consistency, different texture than when they're eating the feed that the farmers give them. When we lived in California, my husband and I lived in Monterey, California for a little while, and we actually went to a butter tasting. We were invited to at a local dairy, which was a very weird idea to me. I never thought of eating butter straight. But the whole point is that they had butter from all over the world. And cows take the taste of whatever they've eaten, and it goes into their milk. So if they're eating the really good fresh grass in the spring, 
their butter comes out this rich yellow color and you can actually taste it. In fact, there were some butters we tasted from France where you could actually taste the herbs that were growing in the ground. Like when they, there are cows from Gilroy, California and it's the garlic capital of America. Oh my. And the butter, we actually thought they had made us garlic butter and they hadn't. It was just, there was so much garlic in the soil there that had gotten into the grass and the things that the cows were eating and it tasted like garlic butter. My, my husband's family when he was younger owned uh, goats because his little brother brother could only drink goat's milk rather than cow's milk. And so one of their chores was to milk the goats and they had to feed the goats and they, goats eat everything, right? So at one point they were trimming some lilac bushes and they just threw the the branches into the goat's pen. And and the goats ate the lilac branches. And they said that batch of milk, nobody could drink it because it tasted like lilacs. (laughs) That's horrible. I know. It's but funny. That also led to, I mean, color variations. Yes, absolutely. So sometimes of the year, the butter may look bright yellow, and other times, particularly the winter, it's much a much paler color. Kind of like today, mm-hmm. we're used to a pretty pale butter. But butter was important because it was another way to preserve the milk. The milk by itself doesn't last very long, especially without refrigeration. Milk doesn't last very long. But if you can preserve it in another form, like butter or cheese, it it will last a whole lot longer. And the advantage to butter is that it's a pretty quick preservation process. It doesn't last as long as cheese, but it doesn't take as long to make it either. Well, and we want to point out that butter in its solid form was not the only way of preserving it, particularly because in warm climates, that solid butter didn't stay good for very long. The fat would go rancid because of of the, the milk solids in the butter. So particularly in the Mediterranean, in the equatorial Middle East, and in India especially, they started clarifying butter, which is where you take the butter, you heat it until the, the oil separates from those whitish milk solids. And then you, just like taking the cream off, you skim those milk solids off, and you're left with this kind of clear oil from the butter. In India, it's called ghee. You may have heard of that. G-H-E-E. And that's a clarified butter that's had those solids removed. And in India, because cows were sacred, ghee was very important. So now that you understand the actual ways that butter were made, let's talk about the actual history of butter. Butter actually goes back at least four to 7,000 years as this preservation technique. It has African origins, and it was used originally with a lot of nomadic peoples. This was their way of quickly preserving milk while they were traveling from place to place. In fact, the earliest butter-making apparatus, they believe, was a bladder that was suspended between a few sticks and could either be carried on people's shoulders or suspended between animals while traveling from place to place. How efficient! Very efficient, right? And by the time that they reached their destination at the end of the day, they would have butter. And this wasn't limited to the African continent. Well, it was known that the Mongols, what they would do in the morning is they would take a bladder, fill it with milk, put it under their saddle, and they'd go off riding, and then later in the day, it would be butter. And that was their campaign rations, if you will. Mm -hmm. And butter particularly thrived in those nomadic areas, but also in northern Europe, where it became very popular with the Vikings because, again, it was an easy way of preserving milk, and they were one of the areas that had an abundance of it because they'd gotten very, very good at domesticating cattle and goats and sheep, which is why by the time you get to the Roman and Greek periods, they viewed butter as a purely barbarian food. In some cases, it was medicinal. In fact, in some Greek plays, they referred to the Thracians as butter eaters, which was a perjurative. Pliny the Elder, in his natural history called butter, the most delicate of food among barbarian nations. And they discuss that it's purely medicinal. No one's interested in eating it. They think that it may simply be a way of helping with certain certain illnesses. And during the same period, we see that ghee was becoming very important in India. Because cows are sacred in Hindu culture, it it kind of straddled this line. People couldn't eat cows, but they provided this milk that was so important. So they would clarify the ghee and use it in daily life. But ghee was also used as a symbol of purity. It was an offering to the gods, especially Krishna and Agni. They would emphasize the sacred nature of ghee. So they would add these sacred herbs to the ghee and then take it to the temple where it would be used to fuel holy land. They would use it even when they were purifying bodies for funerals or during uh, standard purification rituals after birth or other times. But at the same time, they were also using it as part of their daily life, which is one of the things I love about Hindu culture is that a lot of times you see this balance where something is both sacred and part of the everyday. But that's not what was happening in Europe at the time. Eventually, butter caught on beyond just Northern Europe. 
and it was a, a pretty popular peasant food because the the richer someone was, the more space they had to take that milk and store it to turn it into cheese. But if you were a poor peasant, you didn't have massive storerooms. You had time to take your daily milk that you were able to get, quickly preserve it into butter, and use it that way. So cheese was a sign of aristocracy and of wealth. wealth. Exactly. Butter was a sign that you didn't have a lot of time, you didn't have a lot of space or storage. And people really weren't interested in it. The only area where it really was catching on was again in Scandinavia, where they were producing butter so much that they were actually exporting it during the early Middle Ages. Then in Northern Europe, again, because they had so much butter, they started needing to preserve it for longer. So they would pack it into these barrels. They called them firkins. And they would bury them in peat bogs. Oh, uh-huh. peat bog basically is just a... Uh, a wetland that has been filled with organic matter. And like a compost. Plants, it's co- mm-hmm. Like a compost. But one of the characteristics of it is that all the oxygen is used up mm. so that nothing can basically grow there except certain types of bacteria. It's a, a way of preserving things. In fact, in various places, uh, trees have fallen into bogs. 50,000 years later, you're able to harvest those trees. And so they're harvesting these trees 50,000 years old. Still wood. They they're found not... bodies in bogs, too. I mean, you, well, if, you, yes. if you go and you Google it, you can actually find images of these perfectly preserved bodies that are thousands and thousands of years old that fell into bogs. And knowing this, they were able to take this excess butter, they would shove them into these firkins, seal them, and then they would bury them in the peat bogs. They're still finding them today, even though this was pretty common in about the 10 hundreds to 13 hundreds. They they still find these firkins that someone buried in a bog and forgot about. They pull it out, and even though the butter has this horribly intense peaty smell, it's still good. It may have hardened to more of a cheese, but it hasn't gone rancid. That doesn't sound appealing. It doesn't sound appealing at all, but it, for them, it was certainly more appealing to taste something that tasted a little off than to eat rancid butter that would make you sick. True. And you can get used to eating anything. Just about anything. Well, and that started to change a little bit, the idea that butter was for the peasants only in about the 1500s when the Roman Catholic Church allowed it during Lent, this period of time leading up to Easter where meat was not allowed. You couldn't eat meat, but you could eat butter. And so it started becoming more of a popular uh, item, not just reserved for the peasantry. Particularly when you consider that during Lent, a lot of people were eating a pretty hard bread because that's what was left because they had used up a lot of their animal fat. Eating meat was restricted in Lent, so they couldn't even render the fat. So they had this pretty hard bread that didn't have any fat in it. And suddenly they could put butter on that bread. Which makes it much more appetizing. Especially if you were wealthy enough to have access to herbs and salt to make the butter taste even better. Now, the more this middle class and upper class started to adopt butter, is particularly in Europe, the more they discovered that Butter from different areas tasted better, particularly butter from northern France. Because of the climate there, because of the soil there, just like grapes develop all these amazing flavors in France, so does the butter. That was an economic power that France had, and butter caught on really quickly in France compared to other areas. As this demand for particularly northern French butter came in, they started developing more efficient ways of making it. They moved beyond that very basic butter churn we've all seen with the stick and the hole that goes up and down to in the 17 and 1800s, they invented the barrel churn, which is kind of what you were mm-hmm. describing, Frank. It's like a, a, a large barrel and there's a turn on the side that you can twist and that will agitate the butter to separate things out. And then there's a little lever on the side, a little valve, so that you can drain out the buttermilk as you go. They also developed something called a paddle churn, which was a, a box with a wheel that went round and round, again, that you could crank and would do the same thing. And all these are types of churning which can use water power Mm -hmm. to power them. Yes, which is what the precursor to industrialization. At the same time, because they're trying to find ways to be more efficient. So instead of simply getting a small little cup or two of milk to churn, they decided to start collecting the milk. And they would collect enough for it a day or two before churning it. And what that created was the culturing Emily discussed before. So there is this bacteria found in dairy products. It's lactobacillus. I'm not saying that right. It eats the sugars in the milk. Basically, it's a form of fermentation. It cultures it and it creates this richer flavor as a byproduct of eating those sugars. So if you let your milk sit for a day or two and then you churned it, your milk had this even more rich, delightful flavor. And that's what the culturing was. People started to really like this and they started to study this more and try to understand what was happening throughout the 1800s. 
industrialization was dragging people into the cities. So people didn't have people who had this this taste for milk didn't have space for their own cows. They didn't have a dairy right next door. But you had these larger dairies for, forming to bring milk products into the city. And that's where industrialization really started to hit the dairy industry. Like we talked about in our episode about what people in the year 1900 thought the year 2000 would look like, people were looking for ways to uh, delegate or outsource these really cumbersome labor-intensive tasks. And butter making was one of those. Anything with a dairy was one of those. In fact, when uh, there's a, a blog we'll link to on our website about a woman who actually worked as a dairy maid at a historical reenactment site. And she describes what her day was like being a dairy maid and making butter. It was nearly a full-time job. So people were quite happy to take this cumbersome task, outsource it to an industrial dairy, and then just buy it at the store. It made people's lives a lot easier. And allowed them to focus on doing what they could do and make money and not be sidetracked. And as electric power, water power, steam power came in, they adapted these barrel churns and paddle churns and others into these larger industrial products. They also started experimenting with better ways of preserving it. That's one of the reasons we add salt is not merely for flavor, but it helps preserve the fat for longer. It was also the first time people really started dealing with a shift in orders. As these larger dairies grew, they had some contracts that were for massive amounts of butter. But you also had people who would come to their state or to their location or order a small, maybe half a pound a day. Or to their milkman. Or to, this is where the, is the milkman, milkman came in, in yes. as well. And it wasn't just bringing you milk. You would order what you needed from this milkman and he would bring you a small amount of butter or a large amount, depending on what you needed. But I don't want anyone to get the idea that it was just industrialization. This is where we started to get that split where you had these very large butter producers, but also people doing it the same way they had for centuries, using those small churns at home, coming up with their own ways of making butter last longer. So in about the 1860s, the Emperor Napoleon is needing to feed his army and his navy, and he is facing a butter shortage. Now, this is not Napoleon Bonaparte. No, yeah, Emperor, Emperor Napoleon. Louis Napoleon III. III, the yes. yes. And this is a pretty significant period of economic turmoil. I mean, I mean, this is Les Miserables. Oh, the 1860s. Lower class. So Emperor Louis Napoleon III offered a prize to anybody who could come up with a cheap substitute for butter. And I'm going to have to let <laughs> Meredith pronounce this. It's Hippolyte Mege Murier, who was a French chemist, came up with a solution in 1869. He combined beef tallow and skim milk to make oleomargarine. Yeah. He sold that process in 1871 to the Dutch company Jurgens, which is still a subsidiary of Unilever today. But they started calling it something other than oleomargarine. They just called it margarine. And I mean, margarine increased in popularity simply because there was such an animal fat shortage throughout the late 1800s. And this continued for about a hundred years. When you go through so many wars that ravaged Europe. Not only did you have the conflicts, but you also had the development of transportation networks, which while it did help spread the distribution, it also had a lot of areas which weren't part of that. And so until they could be, you had area shortages. Yep. But people still wanted milk, particularly as the idea that farm breakfast and farm culture was healthy for people. People still wanted this to be part of their lives. But when you couldn't get milk, butter, you settled for something else, which was this margarine. Just a few years after Mige Merrier created his margarine substitute, a man uh, named Henry Bradley in the United States figured out how to combine vegetable oil with animal fat, which is where we got vegetable margarine. So we didn't have to use beef tallow anymore because of the beef shortages, particularly around, I mean, post-Civil War when the South, their agriculture had been devastated. They were able to do that instead. And this increased, they found better and better ways of doing it all the way up into the early 1900s. Now remember how we described that butter could be this really rich yellow color, but it could also be a little bit paler depending on the milk that the cow produced and what the cow had eaten. Well, margarine was white. It wasn't yellow, but people liked that yellow mm -hmm. color that communicated richness and flavor. And my mother told me stories when I was a kid about how when she was a kid uh, in the Depression, in World War II especially, her job in the family was to knead the margarine with this dye to turn it into a yellow 
butter looking like substance. Mm-hmm. And that's actually kind of interesting too, because I know you, I'm sure you've seen that some dairy products, especially cheeses, have these kinds of streaks of yellow and white through them. Well, some of that can be traced back to margarine because these early dyes were not very effective. People had to take the margarine, put it in a bowl, dump in this dye, and kind of try to mix it. And they were rushed. It was just a cosmetic thing. And it didn't blend very well with the oils because it was a, a liquid. So... They started serving this margarine, and it would have these streaks. It looked like it was marbled with yellow and white. But dairy producers didn't want the margarine producers to be able to market their margarine as a complete substitute for the butter. So they lobbied to prevent these margarine producers from adding a yellow dye. Which is interesting because butter producers had been dyeing their butter Mm -hmm. for hundreds of years. Everyone had. Everyone had, had, because they knew that people associated yellow butter with better health. They'd been adding turmeric and marigolds and all these other seasonings. And so dairy farmers were just continuing that long tradition of dyeing it. But whoa, 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 margarine was stepping on their turf. The dairy farmers lobbied Congress to prevent them from adding dye, and they succeeded. Margarine producers were not allowed to dye their margarine anymore. So margarine producers came up with a very ingenious (laughs) workaround. In 1951, the W.E. Dennison Company received a patent for new kind of packaging. They didn't dye it. No, no. They did not dye the margarine themselves. No, no. They included a capsule of yellow dye inside the (laughs) plastic (laughs) package of margarine. So that after the margarine was purchased, the consumer could break the capsule inside the package and knead it to distribute the dye throughout, and voila, you have yellow margarine. By the 50s, those laws kind of went out the window, and all bets were off with artificial coloring. So you could add whatever colorings you wanted to to margarine. And part of that was due to the fact that in the 50s, You started getting people to be concerned about health, and butter starting to get a bad rap. Yes. But initially, it was thought that butter was the healthiest for you. And then margarine came along, and margarine was healthier. And then we'll talk here in a little bit about spread, which was also another innovation that was thought to be healthier. And then they discovered things like trans fats and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So this whole idea that, well, margarine's healthier because it has vegetable oil in it. But then some other people are saying, no, 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 butter's healthier for you. And a Scandinavian company finally comes up with the perfect solution. They combine butter oils with vegetable oils. And this confuses the entire market because people are saying, well, but it's not a margarine, but it's not a butter. So they invent this lovely new term, spread. It's a buttery spread. And so if you're walking through the dairy aisle at the grocery store and you see margarine, butter, and spread... That's what those words actually mean. Also, with the advent of pasteurization, people began to understand that the bacteria that made butter taste so good could also be very, very deadly if the the balance got out of whack. In fact, the tuberculosis deaths of the late 1800s and early 1900s, some of those were from respiratory tuberculosis, but a huge number of children died from bovine tuberculosis that was actually transmitted in this unpasteurized milk that people were receiving. And that was a kind of almost silent tuberculosis. So as as germ theory came in and they understood pasteurization, it's one of the reasons they started. They wanted to save all these children. But that also created two different styles of butter. If you've ever seen in the grocery store, you may see European-style butter being advertised. That's butter that is still cultured. They still let it sit with that bacteria in a much more controlled environment than they did a few hundred years ago to produce that more cultured taste. And that's still incredibly popular in most of Europe and most of the world. Here in the U.S. and in Canada, they use sweet cream butter, which is butter that is made without that culturing step. It's immediately taken, quickly skimmed, and without any waiting period thrown in and turned into butter. And now we've reached kind of this this weird state where most of us eat butter that basically tastes the same all the time. It's produced in on large industrial dairies. Um, the From cows pasteurized milk. Mm-hmm. Cows are basically fed the same thing most of the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and once in a while, you'll find you know d- uh, made from grass fed. Uh, 
cows or, or things like that. But in general, we're all eating pretty much the same sweet cream butter. It is cream and salt, and that's the only variation we really find most of the time. And all the milk is basically poured in together, so it's all homogenized mm -hmm. besides being homogenized. We're reaching, I mean, there's still people who've always been kind of making their own butter, and especially if you talk to your grandparents, you may have them still having these memories of stripping that cream off and making their own butter. But there's this weird trend that's, if you spend any time on Pinterest, you've probably seen it, where people say, hey, did you know you can make your own butter in a blender? And they show you how to take just a regular old pint of whipping cream, put it in your blender, and agitate it to create your own butter. Now, I tried this a little while ago. I'd read all these reviews that said, oh, the butter tastes so much better because it's homemade. And I was expecting it to taste freaking fabulous. But it tastes like regular old butter from the store. There was absolutely no difference. No matter what I added, it just, it tasted like regular butter. And that's because the whipping cream that you use, that you buy at the store, is the exact same stuff that they use in those dairies to make the butter that you would buy in the store. So you're not really getting any improvement on quality by making it yourself. It's not even more cost effective. But what you are seeing now is a trend towards more small batch butter making. People are more interested in buying local and... We have this kind of dichotomy breaking out, just like they did in the 1800s, between these larger industrial manufacturers and these smaller folks producing butter. And a really cool example of that recently is a company called Banner Butter based out of Atlanta. It's run by Andrew and Elizabeth McBath, who have day jobs. They are business analysts and uh, one is a prosecuting attorney. They make about 400 pounds of butter a week. They have a high-tech churn that makes about 25 gallons of cream into butter. They do about two batches a day. They're getting a lot of attention doing it in this Atlanta suburb. Elizabeth says that she, she adores butter, and here's a quote from her. It's delicious, it's beautiful, it's been around a long time, but when I walked down the dairy aisle in a grocery store and looked at all the butter there, there was nothing interesting, nothing that I thought would be wonderful to eat, and I thought we could change that. So they sell this butter now to local stores. Some of it's on Delta Airlines flights. They buy it from a couple of local dairies and they actually do culture their milk. They introduce very specific bacteria into it in a controlled environment. They let it sit for about 24 hours to let that flavor really develop. And then they churn it in these two batches. They sanitize the equipment each time to make sure they're not going to contaminate it. And then they, they might add spices or sea salt or herbs. And then they hand wrap it into these little rounds. The, they say, we've talked to elderly people who are excited about our product because when they were growing up, their grandmother made butter for their house. And also to the upwardly mobile yuppies who are excited about it because they're yearning to live more simply. Butter is one of the very few foods that transcends all cultures, all differences. It's an honor to help bring it back. Well, I know for me, when I taste butter... It reminds me of my grandmother. Yes. Because we ate margarine growing up because at the time that was considered the most healthy and it was cheaper. But when I taste butter, I it tastes like grandma's mm -hmm. house to me. What I find really fascinating about this story from a hidden history perspective is that when the McBaths went to figure out how to make this small batch butter, they couldn't find any instructions or data on how to do it. Everything was either geared towards huge industrial scale manufacturing or using your little home blender. And after months of searching, they finally had to go back to dairy journals from 100 years ago. And when they went through these dairy journals, which are a combination of personal narratives from dairy farmers and reports, just like you might read any periodical, these were farmers who were reporting on trial and error, observations, charts of temperatures, pH, moisture content, and churning time. And they were analyzing these in great detail. That whole idea that it was a simpler time in the past, that these were less sophisticated people living simpler lives, isn't true. Dairy farmers 100 years ago, 200 years ago, were technologically advanced. And they were very aware of the different factors that went into milk, and they were always looking for a better way to preserve, a better way to create flavor. And now we have companies that are drawing on them to produce better products that can actually compete in a mostly industrialized market. But you see this over and over again. You see the concept that our ancestors were dumb barbarians. I'm exaggerating there. But, but that, that we are the enlightened ones. The sophisticated right. ones. The knowledgeable ones. That we have progressed beyond the simpler, less sophisticated times of the past. Well, like I talked about in our first episode about my O2 submarine back in the early 90s. 1990s, I should add. <laughs> I'm not that old. 
everyone thought I was talking about the 2002 submarine, which we were talking about building at the time. No, I was talking about the 1902 submarine, the SS-2, the OSS Plunger, the second submarine in the U.S. Navy. It was amazingly sophisticated. But people kept bringing you ideas for this new submarine, and you could show them how their idea was already in the 100-year-old submarine. Yes, yes. We assume that because we don't know that they did it, technology has somehow made us better well, at producing things. It's this filter of, of presentism that mm -hmm. we go through, that we assume that because we're doing it today, obviously we must know better than they did back then. And another great example of this was the TED Talk, How to Make a Toaster, where he wanted to make a toaster from raw materials. But in order to do that, he had to go back 200, 300 500 years to find out how people process ores so that he can make just a small lot because everything today is about making iron in 100 million ton lots. And the amount of effort and innovation it takes to turn these already processed materials into a toaster or something else is really significantly less than it took to figure out how to take that ore and turn it into something that was useful and functional. Yes. Now, um, you were talking about presentism. Well, it's just the idea, this bias that we have that because we live today, we know better than everything that has come before us in the past. It's this idea that progress is this linear upward slope, that there's not so much we can learn from the past, that we already we already know everything that we could learn from the past, that there's no need to really look back. It's kind of a, a condescending way of looking at our ancestors, of the assumption that it was a simpler time, the assumption that whatever technological advances they came up with, well, we came up with something better. We built on that and we made it better. And there's nothing that we can really learn from the past. Now, that's a simplified description of presentism, but I find it a very, very common in a lot of people that they simply don't recognize what we can learn from the past. But then we also have this kind of backlash to that with this idea of the Pinterest butter. Yes. The idea that, well, what we're doing right now is so bad with the industrial scale of making butter that it's better for us to buy our own whipping cream and make it in our blender. When you actually look at the history that's and the just simple chemistry of it and the sourcing of it, that's not really significantly different at all. It's almost this romanticization of doing it ourselves. Yes, and I think that kind of gets back to a whole lot of other issues of, of distrust of big business and industrialization and, you know, what's really going in our food. I mean, that's a whole other topic we can get into. But you also see that with coffee. We had um, what people thought was great tasting coffee in the early 50s. They started having shortages, and so... The coffee got diluted with lesser types. And then Starbucks appears on the scene with great coffee because we've gotten used to this industrialized coffee and it wasn't that good. Well, and yeah, I think we kind of see that with butter. People became so very used to margarine that they didn't know what good butter tasted like. Yes. That people became so separated from that process. And now there's kind of this uh, this yearning to get back to that. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think that this whole Banner Butter Company is very interesting, kind of on two fronts there. Because one, they actually are going back to history, not just in how they make the butter, but in the fact they're doing what people did for centuries. They have lives, they have other things that they do, and they're making butter on the side and selling to people. This is much more representative of how people have been creating products and selling surpluses for a very long time. But I also find it really interesting that they keep talking about how people are yearning for a simpler time. Because if there's anything I'm seeing in this history of butter and it's it's not really, there was never a simpler time. While it's simple to make in theory, that shaking and separating, it's never played a really simple role in history. It's always been about survival and adaptation and Napoleon, I mean, riots could have broken out if they didn't have a butter substitute. That's that's a huge deal. If anything, we live in the simpler time. Because if I want butter, I just go down to the grocery store. Mm -hmm. I can buy butter. I can buy in any amount I want. Well, I couldn't have done that at any other time in history. That's true. One of the other things that we're seeing here, though, is that with this move back to making small lots, we sort of went from making small lots historically, to the industrialization of butter production, which created a uniform product. Now, what we start seeing is the micro commun uh, commercialization mm. of it. So you're making small lots and it's being done so it can compete in the marketplace with these large producers. Well, that's it for this episode on butter. Thanks for joining us. Before we go, I want to tell you guys about a cool new podcast that we've been listening to. 
The History Buffs is a group of about seven historians out of the University of Buffalo with enormous range. You've got experts in wet nursing and disabled Civil War veterans, British imperialism, the American West, environmental history, food history, and they mix and match which group of two or three experts are going to host each episode depending on the subjects they're discussing. You get the history of Buffalo, New York, the history of Charlemagne's coronation, Pearl Harbor, and all sorts of other aspects of the history you're not going to find in the average history textbook, and that's what I love. And if you liked this episode on butter and want to know more, next month they're going to be doing an episode on butter lambs, which are these butter sculptures you find in a lot of Polish delis right around Easter. It's one of those things that's really popular in New York, especially in Buffalo, which is where they're based. So that's how they bring all of this cool information and the history of their own city. They tie it all together into this really cool narrative. If you liked our episodes on food and beer, you should check out their episodes on Renaissance feasting and the history of Thanksgiving food. So I really encourage you to go check them out because they're, they're fun folks. And before we go, we're going to play a preview so you can get to know them a little bit better in their own words. Have you ever wondered what Charlemagne has to do with the history of Islam in Europe? Marissa and Katie have the scoop. Did you know that the pilgrims ate passenger pigeon but not apple pie at the first Thanksgiving? Avril, Sarah, and Tommy will tell you all about it. How did average Americans react to the bombing of Pearl Harbor? Dan and Elizabeth delve into the nitty gritty. Join the History Buffs for these stories and more. Visit historybuffs.org for all of our past episodes and show notes. And find us on iTunes. You can email us at historybuffs716 at gmail.com. Be sure to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at History Buffs Pod. If you like this episode, consider leaving us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or social media. You can find snark, updates, and behind-the-scenes peeks of production on Twitter. Our handle is at HiddenBiz. That's at Hidden B-I-Z. You can also find us on Facebook as The Hidden History of Business. Music for this podcast is from the album Time Within Itself by Michael Waldrop and used with permission of the artist. You can find out more about it on iTunes and Amazon. If you'd like to access show notes and multimedia content and the periodic rant from your hosts, be sure to visit our website at www.hiddenhistoryofbusiness.com. 